attention to the pronouns. If you know anything about me, you know that I love to talk about the grammatical construction of the original New and, uh, New and Old Testament. I like to talk about the translations from the Greek and the Hebrew. I like to look at how the translators have gone about rendering the passages. And I love to pay attention to pronouns. And especially in today's reading from the book of Exodus. Pay attention. Pay attention to the pronouns that are used here. Because the humor in the story is actually rooted in the pronouns. Now, Moses has gone up Mount Sinai. He's gone up Mount Sinai to converse with God and to receive from Yahweh God the commandments, the law, the way in which God wants his people to live and to act and to treat each other. Moses has gone up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, and he's not come back down. Much time has passed, and the people of Israel have become impatient they want Moses to come back and show them Yahweh, show them this God that delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians, show them this God that delivered them from slavery, show them this God and show them the way that this God wants them to live. And Moses has not come back. And so the, Mo the people begin to grumble and to complain and they turn to Aaron and say to him, come, make gods for us who shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now most of us have in our minds an image of this event that comes from the movie The Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille. And we conceive of the people of Israel as murmuring and upset and angry about Moses not coming back down. It, it, Edward G. Robinson, the, the overseer, is there and he's flipping his coin and says, where's your Moses now? Yeah, 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 see, he's not here. No, let's make gods for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so he gets Aaron and he makes Aaron make these gods. Aaron says, take all the gold from your earrings, your wives and your daughters and your sons, that hasn't changed, by the way. Sons, earrings, and take the gold and put them into a mold and fashion a god. And so they take the gold earrings and they give them to Aaron, and Aaron melts it down and fashions it into a mold of a golden calf. And he sets it up, and the people proclaim. And notice it's the people, not Aaron. The people proclaim. It says, they proclaim. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow, tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. Now, you'll notice in your Bibles that it, and almost every English Bible does it this way. Here you find the Lord is printed in all caps. Capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. That's sort of highlighting. That's like an indicator to the reader that this isn't just any old Lord or Master. This just isn't any old Adonai in Hebrew. This is the Adonai. This is Yahweh. You see, the Israelites were afraid of speaking the Lord's name, of speaking Yahweh's name. And so later on, based upon what they learned from the Ten Commandments, they decided that they would not even pronounce it when reading it. So when reading the Hebrew Bible, they come along God's personal name, Yahweh. They wouldn't say Yahweh, they would say Adonai. And to make sure that you wouldn't do that, you wouldn't say Yahweh, they took the vowels out of Yahweh and put in the vowels for Adonai. And it created a very interesting word that doesn't exist in Hebrew, Jehovah. But we'll talk about that at some other time. Anyway, Yahweh is the personal name of God, but you're not supposed to pronounce it. You're supposed to pronounce Adonai. And to tell you that's what's going on in Hebrew, the translators translate Yahweh as capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. Okay? And that's what we have here. And this is very important. You see, 
Aaron is trying to understand this golden calf he has fashioned as an image of Yahweh. He's not trying to create some other god. He's not trying to create some other deity. He's not trying to say, this calf is the god that brought you out of the land of Egypt. No, he is saying this calf is an image of Yahweh who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This calf is an image of the Creator that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He's doing what he knows. And before we're a little too hard on him, he didn't know any better. Moses hasn't yet come back with the Ten Commandments. He hasn't come down with the commandments that say, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make any graven image, anything that is in heaven or on earth. Moses hasn't come back with the Ten Commandments from God saying what, he sh what should and should not be done in this instance. Aaron is doing what he knows or what he thinks is the right thing to do. He's making an image of Yahweh to place before the people. So don't, I, I have to remind myself repeatedly, he's doing what he thinks is the right thing to do. And of course, it's the wrong thing to do. And that's what plagues us so frequently, isn't it? We try to do what we think with our minds and our understanding is the right thing to do. And so frequently we overrun or ignore Scripture. We overrun or ignore tradition. We overrun or ignore what God has said for us to do. And we end up doing the wrong thing. Here Aaron is doing what his culture and society has told him he ought to do. And he's doing the wrong thing. Hmm. There's a wonderful story written in a book by a friend of mine, Anthony Tomasino. He's a professor of Bible, Old Testament, and Hebrew at Bethel College in Indiana. And in his book, Written Upon the Heart, he tells the following story. One of the big toy flops was the Jesus doll. It was about the size of a G.I. Joe or a Barbie, only it was dressed in clothing that was associated with Bible stories and with the hair and beard that we associate with Jesus. Manufacturers were sure it would be a great big hit with Christians, and especially at Easter time and at Christmas time, you know, putting it in Easter baskets and for confirmation and at Christmas time. But the few parents who actually bought the Jesus doll ended up returning it to the store. The reasons? They didn't like their children taking Jesus' clothing off and leaving him lying around naked nor did they care for Jesus dating Barbie or riding in a dump truck or dropping toy bombs along with G.I. Joe on other toy soldiers or using his magic powers to make advanced G.I. Joe's offensives against the offensive line. No, they didn't like this toy Jesus laying around being misused. The problem with images is that they tend to do whatever we want them to, whether they should be doing it or not. The problem with images, graven images as the traditional translation renders it, the problem with images is that it is limited both by human conception and it lends itself to human control or twisting or spinning. Humans can take this image, whatever it may be that's been crafted, and twist it or spin it or make it do whatever it is we want it to do. Hence this image of the golden calf is supposed to be, according to Aaron, was supposed to be an image of Yahweh, and yet it could be used and perverted for all sorts of other things. The, the Scripture says that they went to bed and they got up the next day and they had their feast and they had a great big party. They had a revel in the name of Yahweh here at the foot of Mount Sinai around this golden calf. 
this image that Aaron had crafted with the best intentions, this image that Aaron had crafted of Yahweh. What kind of images do we craft of God? What kind of images do we place instead of God? You have that, that sign, that Texas Ranger sign? Bring it up here. You happen to still have it, yes. The Church of the Holy Home Run, yes. See this? I want to make sure that those out on the internet all over the world can see this. <laughs> Last night, the Texas Rangers got into the World Series for a second year in a row. This time they're going to win, amen? <laughs> Our friends in England call baseball rounders. I guess they don't particularly find this of interest. Nevertheless, the Texas Rangers and crews, some people do indeed treat ball teams and athletes and individuals like idols. They treat them like idols. They spend time on them as they would on idols. You can tell what someone thinks is of great value by how you spend your time and your money. Whatever your principal priority is, you spend your time and your money on it. After they won the game last night, I got online just to find out how much it would cost for me to go to the first game back in Arlington in the World Series. The cheapest I could find was somewhere in the three to four hundred dollar range. And that's for seats that are over somewhere around Ulysses. All right? <laughs> Not even in the stadium. Got better view from my parsonage on my screen. I'm going to say that's where I'm going to be sitting watching that game. And behind home plate, $3,800 per person. Wow. Wow. You can tell what someone's priorities are by how they spend their time and their money. You can identify their deities, their gods, those things that they think are most important by how they spend their time and how they spend their money. I think it's interesting to follow the response to this event up on Mount Sinai. The Lord said to Moses, Yahweh said to Moses, go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn away from the way I have commanded them, and they have cast the, for themselves the image of a calf, and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are, now let me alone, so that, I may, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. God, didn't you remember? We haven't even taken them the Ten Commandments yet. How are they supposed to know? God, no, don't, don't, don't you remember? You said, you promised that you would give them Descendants like the stars up in the heaven and the sands by the seashore. Do you really want these Egyptians to say about you that you brought these people out into the wilderness to kill and consume them? Oh, no. Oh, no, God. Oh, no. Oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? whom you brought out of the land of Egypt. It's like hot potato time. God says, okay, Moses, they're your people. And Moses says, no, 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 they're not mine, they're yours. I I'm serious. Pay attention to the pronouns. Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. Oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? No, they're not my people, God. They're yours, oh Yahweh. 
They're your people. You made them. You sent me to them. You told me I was to bring them out of Egypt. It's your doing, not mine. Hot potato, hot potato, hot potato. I don't want to have anything to do with them. But, but, Yahweh, but, why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore by them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens, and all this land that I have promised I will give you and your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. God, you made all these promises about them. You brought them out of captivity in Egypt. You did all these things. Now you're going to wipe them out? Do you want the Egyptians to say this about you, God? You know what? For someone who was afraid to talk and afraid to go to Pharaoh and who stuttered, Moses suddenly got brave, didn't he? I mean, think about it. This is the same guy who at the burning bush said, I don't want to go. I stutter. I don't know how to speak. I don't want to do this. You choose somebody else. Please, please, please choose somebody else. He tried to wimp out. And now he's standing up before Yahweh, the creator of the universe, and saying, wait a minute, God. You don't want the Egyptians to say this about you. Moses got some bravery here, didn't he? Part of me thinks he's kind of stupid, really. But thank God for Moses. Now we have an interesting problem with translation because of what it says next. And the Lord and Yahweh changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. The King James renders that as relented. It could also, the, the Hebrew word used here could also mean to repent. But it has in a more meaningful, emotional sense, it has the meaning of to be sorry for, to be moved to pity on account of, to have compassion for, to be relieved or ease oneself about, to be consoled about, to be concerned with. In other words, not changed his mind, but instead Moses' words drew Yahweh to have compassion and pity for this people. Have compassion, concern for these people. And since he had compassion for them, pity for them, the same compassion, the same pity, the same concern that caused him to send Moses to deliver them from captivity now causes God to look at with concern and say, no. I won't blot them out, although they deserve it. I won't consume them, although they deserve it. I mean, this is just the first of them. I mean, this is just the first event. There's going to be repeated event again and again and again and again. When this people, stiff-necked though they are, they're going to break the law repeatedly, even after they get it. They're going to expand upon it. They're going to spin it. They're going to change it. They're going to try to adjust it and get out of some parts and apply other parts to other people. They're going to try to adjust this thing continually. This is just the first event. I ought to just wipe them out and start over with you, Moses. But compassion, pity, concern causes me instead to not do that. Instead, Yahweh, now there is something of a slaughter event that occurs a little later, but no, Yahweh doesn't blot out all the Israelites. Instead, he works with them, he chastises them, he punishes them, he teaches them, he strives with them, he continually strives with them as he strives with us. Images. 
These images from Exodus are powerful. They speak to us of the love and compassion of God. They speak to us of the justice of God. They speak to us of the calling that we have to follow Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And not any self-made image that we would create. There's a horror science fiction film made back in the 1980s entitled, They Live. In this film, aliens are living among us. And you can't really tell them who they are unless you have a very special pair of glasses. You put your glasses on and suddenly you can see, aha, human, 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 alien, alien, human, human, alien, alien. And and you can also see their messages. You look up at some advertisement that seems to be for toothpaste, but you put your glasses on and it says, obey. And this guy who has gotten a pair of these glasses and has for the first time in his life seen the aliens and seen the subliminal messages has these glasses on and he looks down at some money, some dollars in his hand. And he notices that on the dollars are written the words, this is your God. Ooh. This is your God. God dollar. Images. Baseball, football, the Church of the Holy Touchdown. Images. Rock stars. Pop stars. Actors and actresses. Images. Golden calves. Crosses. Some people treat religious items like crosses or icons as if they were God, and they're not. They're tools to help one remember God and remember what Jesus did for us. But they are not themselves God. The danger of images is that we can control them. We can pervert the message they contain. And we think, therefore, we can control God. Instead of crafting an image of Yahweh, instead of crafting an image of God, instead of trying to form and mold an image of the Creator, we are to be about allowing the Creator to form and mold us. Instead of trying to adjust and configure and create a God that we want to follow, we are called to be adjusted and molded and created after the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So often we speak about God as my God, our God. We even sing it. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Our God, my God, my Savior. No, my brothers and sisters, it is the other way around. We don't own God. We don't own Jesus. God, Jesus, owns us. It's not that God is our God. It's that we are God's children. We are God's people. God has chosen us, called us to be a part of His family. Allow God to mold and shape you after His image rather than trying to mold and shape God after ours. We are called to open ourselves to God's molding and shaping of us. In this story we learn that God gets angry. God also has compassion, concern, and relents from taking harsh action and blotting out all the people of Israel. We also learn that the people are just like us, quick to act and slow to think. And we finally learn that all we have to do, instead of molding and shaping an image of God, we're called to allow God to open ourselves to God so that God can mold and shape us after the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
My brothers and sisters, that's the calling that we have today as Christians. That's the calling the Israelites had in their day, to open themselves to the presence of Yahweh and allow the Creator to touch and mold and change them. So also we are called to allow the Creator of the universe to mold and shape us. My prayer for us as we move in to the end of this uh, church year and on towards Advent, my prayer for us as we move through the stewardship season, my prayer for us is that we would be open to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives that can indeed mold and shape and transform us into the image of Jesus Christ our Lord so that when others look and see us, they'll be looking through us and seeing the love of God. May we truly reflect to all the beautiful light of the love of our glorious God who molds us and shapes us and transforms us into better and better and more perfect images of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of Northgate United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2011 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information or to listen to other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at Northgate United Methodist Church, 3700 West Northgate Drive, Irving, Texas, 75062. This program was produced by Dr. Gregory Neal.